Hello. I guess we're live now. <laughs> it doesn't change too much for us. Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the Horace's Young Visionaries uh, panel at this extraordinary meeting. I am so happy uh, that I am joined by these six amazing, inspiring entrepreneurs. Um, and today we'll have a conversation about impact entrepreneurship and about how, um, how to build your company when you are combining impact and profit from the get-go, which uh, adds an extra layer of complexity to entrepreneurship. Um, and one of the means to help you build and scale your business is to get investment. So we'll also get a look at how investment helps, uh, how it can help, how it's different for businesses that combine impact and profit, and how it's working for these um, seven, no, I'm number seven, 46 um, <laughs> people in the conversation. I'll introduce myself briefly as well. My name is Jontja Braakman, and I'm the founder of Impact Shakers. Impact Shakers is a global impact ecosystem working to bridge the gap between impact and profit. And we do that by working on inclusive entrepreneurship. We help to get more diverse people into entrepreneurship because we believe that holds the key to tackling more complex societal problems with entrepreneurship. We have an online community for impact entrepreneurs. We have online courses, of which our flagship course is uh, Raise Funding for Your Impact Business. Uh, we have a startup studio, um, which is transforming into an investment fund right now. And uh, we have a couple of nonprofit projects. Uh, one of them is with Opportunity Youth. And we're starting one where we'll help business school students work on homelessness. So if any of these projects um, are of interest to any of you, please reach out. Uh, you can find my name and contact details um, on LinkedIn. Um, hello, um, would you like to start by introducing yourself, Mabinti? Fantastic. Hello, everyone. It's truly a pleasure to be here in this um, conversation. My name is Mabinti Karoma Moore, and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Live Africa. Live Africa is an impact investing company. We provide impact measurement and management support for investors entrepreneur support organization, as well as entrepreneurs. We work out of Nairobi, Kenya, as well as the US, and we work with investors to drive more capital to African women-led businesses and businesses that believe in gender balanced teams in order to drive and realize material impact. For us, we're committed to supporting companies in health, education, the arts, agribusiness, tech, and we're looking to work more deeply so that we can harmonize the way we measure and understand impact and that we can address the financing cap experienced by a lot of African women. And so we are truly honored to be here and connect and learn how we can work and collaborate together to address the financing gap, the knowledge gap, and realize positive impact in the world and especially across the African continent. Thank you. Sai, uh, would you like to... Hi, Yonka. Thank you so much uh, for giving opportunity to be on this platform. So I'm Sai. I'm co-founder of Bharat Agri. Uh, we are an agri-tech platform working with more than uh, five, five, uh, 500 k farmers in India. We have an agri-tech solution which helps in guiding farmers in step-by-step -step for their farming activities, uh, where using our ML technique, we help them in increasing the uh, their production and also reducing their cost of production uh, so using our technology uh, the farmers in india are able to have more than 60 percent productivity at the same time near 20 percent uh, decrease in their cost of production uh, currently our major focus is india and going forward we will be expanding our base in southeast asia thank you uh, okay Hi everyone, uh, I'm pleased to meet you. Uh, my name is Oka. I'm the co-founder of Recyclo. Uh, Recyclo is a waste management, data analytic, and compliance uh, platform. 
uh, for businesses. So we are a B2B uh, platform as a service model. So what we do is we provide a uh, circular economy uh, waste management solution for, for the businesses. Uh, and we use AI for data analytic uh, for the company uh, for help to help to help the company to manage their supply chain um, more effecti- effectively. Um, we are also now deploying a machine learning algorithm uh, to do the uh, traceability and to track the whole supply chain of raw material and waste um, um, uh, to manage the to manage them uh, in a circular economy concept. So we are a Singaporean company. Uh, we are based in South Asia with a presence in Myanmar, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Cambodia. Uh, pleased to meet you all. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Rula? Hello. Um, thank you for having me, Yinsha. I Just to tell you a little bit about myself and w- what I'm doing at the moment, I'm the founder of a media transparency and literacy platform. Um, and I, we are driven by a mission to make all media online transparent. Um, to tell you a little bit about how this mission was born, um, I was pretty shocked uh, browsing the internet for, 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 for years. I was often surprised at the number of times I would fall for something that was propaganda or what we now call fake news, um, even though I would consider myself to be reasonably well-read and educated. Just to give you an example, I mean, sometimes I would read anti-climate change articles and for a split second think, that their arguments were were cogent or made sense until I would Google the author, for example. In one particular article, I found out that the author that had put this uh, article together was a a campaigner against climate change financed by big oil and actually was producing these articles on mass scale. Um, So the problem was not everyone has the time to Google authors, sources, biases, to read around a topic and the credibility of an article. So in 2016, I decided to quit my job and apply for a postgraduate degree in machine learning. Um, uh, What I wanted to do was provide this analysis on scale to people. Um, What I realized was that not everybody was interested in these sort of tiny metrics Um, most people consumed content for fun or they consumed it passively. So we went back to the drawing board and what we realized was the most impactful way to fight fake news at scale was actually to provide the individual um, skills to critically evaluate content for themselves. And if we did it early on in life, people could grow up with healthy narratives. Um, So started building a media literacy platform that enabled students to learn how to read online content the way our generation learned to analyze historical sources. So that's to understand context, the author, the motivation, um, you know, and how how they felt or how how they would imagine somebody would feel uh, seeing this particular piece of content. And I think that way we can combat fake news at scale without curtailing the individual freedom of thought um, that, that, that people should have uh, online. Thank you. Uh, Tom? All right. Well, hi, everybody. Um, well, thank you, first of all, to, for having me as well. I'm, I'm super honored to be among such uh, amazing people. Seriously, you guys inspire me. Um, so, uh, hi, I, I, like I said, I'm Tom. I'm uh, the founder and CEO of a company called Humane. Um, our tagline to tell you in, in a quick uh, one is to simplify human life um, by building uh, better, faster and healthier organizations with AI. And the, the the story behind it a little bit actually is that um, you know I guess I've I've had my midlife crisis a bit early and was like you know asking myself all these questions of like you know who am I what what do I want from this world what can I give this world all these questions and I was like okay well I'm gonna impact a billion people's lives positively and then I was like okay cool that's 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 my goal that's what I'm going for you know that's what I'll be doing and then five seconds later it's like wait how how am I how am I gonna do that. Um, and uh, then I started thinking and I, I, I came across this, this uh, Gallup study that said that 85% of people were uh, completely disengaged, emotionally disengaged from their work. And I was like, well, look, that, that's it. Um, I'm, I'm going to work to try to fix that and, and see how, what I can do. And so my, um, my background is in computer science and I see tremendous opportunities in technologies that are completely paradigm shifting. And I, I believe AI is such a, a paradigm shifting technology um, or, or you could, you know, call it a, a general purpose technology. But I, I really like the idea of it provides an opportunity to completely look at the world in a different way. Um, and so I wanted to leverage that par- paradigm shift and, and bring it into companies in, in a sense where we can use it to make jobs more meaningful and, and uh, you know, do more of the humane stuff. That's why we're called humane as well. 
And so in short, um, Humane now is, is really an AI design studio where we uh, empower people to come up with um, AI solutions that they believe are useful for them in their company uh, instead of trying to retrofit uh, use cases or, or, you know, shove down technology down their uh Throats. We're really working with them to see, like, okay, well, what, what, how, like, how, how can we make your job better? Like, what does that look like? And then uh, we look at, okay, what, what does that mean for the process? And then we look at, okay, well, how can we maybe reinvent your organization? Um, longer term, my goal though is very much to, in that sense, also enable um, a societal baseline. What I call uh, is really this this idea that. Um, you know, we, we have these technologies that are in these exponential price performance curves, meaning that, you know, there is at some point a performance from these technologies that is as good as free. And so why not try to use these technologies to kind of, um, again, enable some sort of societal baseline uh, where everybody can, for example, have uh, access to free food uh, by, you know, using AI farms that are completely run on solar. Uh, or, or things like that. And so I'm very interested again in shifting paradigms and seeing how maybe we could, uh, completely reinvent our, our, our systems by, um, you know, looking at the, the very first principles of, of what is running our society today. Um, and, and making sure that we, um, you know, start kind of questioning them because, you know, you, maybe, maybe we don't all, have to go to work to put food on the table. Maybe food is a human right. I don't know. Maybe that's something I want to just, you know, put out there. Anyway, uh, besides that, oh, I totally forgot. I also have a podcast called The Impact Billionaires, and you guys are all invited. So, yeah, thank you. You sure are very expi- inspiring as well, Tom. <laughs> um, Esme? Hi. I don't know how I can follow that now. Um, <laughs> But uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be having this, um, what a really important discussion. Um, so my name is Esme Verity. I'm the uh, co-founder of the British Unite, um, the London chapter. We are a online community built by founders for founders. Um, we are now at about 6,000 members globally. And together we are calling for a more inclusive um and ethical startup um, movement to counter existing uh, startup and venture capital capital culture. We see this as really a a moral imperative to create a different sort of status quo. Uh, And sort of together as a movement, we are working hard to promote alternative forms of financing, alternative business models, um, and really an alternative way to grow as a business. So let me stay with you, uh, Asmi. Um, what what do you see the the problems are with the businesses that come to you uh, regarding investment? Mm, yeah, um, good question. I think for the for the ninety five percent of businesses that come to me for advice, um, the biggest problem is that they are just not they're not venture backable, and that's fine. Not all businesses are scalable in that way, um, can be kind of hit those kind of growth targets. And 95 businesses don't need to be able to do that. But there needs to be more understanding um, that your business is not going to get that kind of funding and you need to look elsewhere. In this, and that's absolutely fine. And actually, you can end up, you know, retaining control, or retaining ownership in a way that's not possible if you are after a VC money, and if you're after an exit. If you're not after an exit, there's just no point going there. And what do you believe are some of the most exciting new um, uh, methods you see out there? Mm, um, I think, um, you know, there's lots of um, crowdfunding opportunities now, um, which is really, really interesting and allows um, lots of people to get involved with with what you do. I think co-ops are a really, really interesting model. I think the the ability to you know actually redistribute wealth and have employees own part of your business is you know it makes so much sense in terms of a business. You don't need to be able to exit. You need to be able to pass that on to other people, um, and it's those kind of ideas that were once really really popular, and consumers really wanted to to be a part of have now got lost. 
Um, and I think if if we if we change that, there's a lot of hope for business, a lot of hope for employees to benefit from the companies that they are working so hard to help grow. Um, one more thing in line with that is the concept exit to community that the zebras are working on together with uh, Nathan Schneider. I think it's such an awesome concept. Could you briefly explain it? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so as a, um, a global movement, um, we are trying to look at different ways of encouraging businesses to exit to your community. So, you know, the obviously the normal way of a, of a VC backed business is to either be acquired or to IPO or to unfortunately just um you know not manage to hit those milestones. Whereas if you are a you know a business of that size there should be an other solution that might make more sense to you. And lots and lots of founders are looking for this other solution that enables them to keep their business um, and help employees. And so we are working um, with lots of different businesses, you know, big, big businesses, small businesses to understand how we can um, work on this idea of exiting to your employees. And we are developing these kind of new models um, that we hope lots of businesses will, you know, we basically just need people to start doing it. And once people are doing it, more of them will do it. And that's what's really exciting about it. Yes, really great new ideas. Um, so I would like to uh, ask all of you the question, like, how does it work for your business? How did you get financed? Um how are you trying to finance the business? What's working well? What's what's not working at all? Uh, Oka, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, for, for us, is, uh, we we saw the I mean we saw the the services solution to to our business clients. Um, uh, for for so, some of the solution can be, can be a little bit expensive. Um, so for example, like let's say I I will provide like 10,000 tents, I will recycle 10,000 tents of your waste. Uh, and, and like, I'll give you a completely like zero waste solutions, but, but the business, they might not have a budget or they, they might not want to use the money to, 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 to get our, our solutions. So what we need to think about is like, we need to, we need to, um, think the, the end user financing model. So let's say the, the, the raw material that we acquire, it, it is, is it, is it possible to monetize it? So let's say you have, a uh, uh, 10,000 tons of uh, plastic, uh, um, like plastic uh, fa fabric, um, like plastic bag. Then what, what we can do is we can find a, um, a buyer who is in the market and they will buy it and they will, they will find a way like to, to make it into a fabric or to make it into a raw material again. So we can, we can actually use the, uh, the money uh, to help them to recycle and also manage their waste. But at the same time, you also have like a, like a, like international market, like carbon market, carbon, carbon trading market. So, so for what we do is um, we use the US and EU uh, EPA standard. So one tenth of recycling is equivalent to around five tenths of uh, carbon footprint saving. So we try to uh, certify uh, those carbon footprint, and we also give this uh, certifications uh, and then carbon surpluses, uh, and we give it to we we sell it to to uh, international trading market. So those sort of financings really help the the end user uh, who is looking for the solutions, uh, and and they they have to do it, and they also need the solutions, but they don't have the money or they don't uh, they don't want to spend the money on this uh, specific uh, solution. So we 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 act, we really think about like how we can provide and push uh, the, the supply economy solution without uh, giving the burden uh, for the end user. So that's, uh, that, that's uh, we do like uh, uh, partially also, but, but we're not just don't, only doing with the, the large uh, corporate, but also we're doing with like, um, like very local community. So for example, one of our clients um, recently uh, purchased a waste to energy plan from us. Um, so they, they don't have money, like, but they have a lot of uh, hosts and, and the hosts produce a lot of host manure. Uh, and the host manure, they, they all, they all go to the, 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 the lake nearby. So it is creating a massive environmental pollutions. So they want to find a solutions, how we can, uh, solve this, uh, this pollution problem at the same time, make, uh, make something out of it. Uh, so positive environmental impact out of it. So we we offer them the uh, waste to energy uh, and waste to uh, natural fertilizer solution to them, and they're like, yeah, you know, we, we like it, like we we will we will do it. But the problem is they don't have the money. 
So what we try to do is like we 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 will go to like uh, different embassy, different donors, different agency. You know, we have this problem. Uh, would you like to fund this project? And they're like, yes, like like one one um, embassy, um, uh, Denmark embassy. They 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 funded the, uh, this project. So so funding um, go to them, and then of course they can use the funding to pay us. And then and after that, community also receive uh, this like you know the the, the real um, uh, the solution that they can use it uh, for the problem that they are having. So I think end user financing model like customer finder model it's very important. So uh, that can be really helpful like to re also. Uh, increase your revenue, also increase the impact, and also your brand recognition as well. So you can basically sell to anyone. You just need to help them to find and use the financing. So that this is one of the models that we use. That is a very intriguing and experimental business model. Um, I think Tom, did you have the discussion this week on uh, how to do circular pricing? Uh, no, it's it's tomorrow. Ah, okay. So they're actually having a discussion specifically on how to figure out um, how to get uh, someone to pay for uh, these type of services. So I think this is a very good example. Um, so uh, how are you, you're financing your business partly by revenue, by being very creative um, in coming up with revenue, but you also um, took some investment money. Is this traditional venture capital or is this impact investment? Uh, it is a mixed uh, funding model. So we have a, uh, we have accelerator, we have angels, we have super angels, uh, we have local conglomerates. Uh, we also have v some of the VC money and some PE fund and also a uh, grant, also viability gap. So we, we take like uh, all the money that we can. Um, the reason is um, we're not like a, like a pure software. We're not, we're not Slack, we're not Google, we're not Facebook. So it, it can be very difficult uh, if you're not a software platform to, or, or like pure tech platform to ask for the funding from the VC. They, they, think you are, they will simply think your business model is not scalable at all. So, um, so then you, you have to prove uh, that it is, it is, uh, it is scalable, uh, but at the same time, they, they, they won't say believe you. So those uh, like institutional money, they can only come after Series B. So for us, it's like for pre-seed, uh, for seed and for, for, for Series A round, uh, you need to have uh, some sort of like de-risking de mechanism. So so we, we basically have to uh, talk to a lot, a lot of people uh, who are potentially um, who can potentially invest in in the in our business portfolio so like for example like grant agency uh, they want to have uh, this impact so what we do is uh, we sort of like adjust uh, our business model to meet their specific requirement then uh, they're like okay we, we, we will give you two hundred thousand uh, dollars to meet your specific goal okay then then this and then we we come back to the VC VC you know we have two hundred thousand dollars to de-risk uh, your 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 investment portfolio they're like okay you know that's interesting so you actually Get in a matching fund. Um, then we also come to the the, the the angels. You know, you you have this uh, grant from from the government. You have this uh, VC uh, is also committing. Uh, would you also like to invest in us? So I think it's a story that like we we need to um, uh, curate to each person. And after we have a like a step one, step two, then we also like uh, curate again. And then we share the story back to the uh, different stakeholder, different investor. Then, then after that, we, we close around. Um, so I, I think one of the advantages that um, that we have it, uh, we started the business in South Asia. So South Asia is uh, it's, it's right now it's a it's a hotspot uh, for the waste pollution. Like Indonesia, you have Indonesia, you have Vietnam, you have Thailand. Like these uh, countries, like they pollute like the oceans a lot. Like so, one of the, like uh, they have the rivers and that are polluting. Uh, the, the, the the global uh the, the ocean pollutions um so we are actually using this uh like big problem uh to to show it to our our uh, different stakeholders uh, who are looking from like China perspective climate change perspective uh from the uh, AZ perspective so we give the different perspective to them and then uh, they invest in us so we raise uh, around one million dollar now we are raising two million dollar for the series a um so yeah i think you just have to be a little bit creative it's uh uh, I agree with uh, Ismail. Like you don't need to raise the fund if if you don't uh, if you don't have, have a plan to exit. Uh, but for us, we we start as a for profit company, a for profit impact company, and we have a very clear goal. Uh, we want to exit in two thousand thirteen or two thousand fifteen. So that with that specific valuations. So we show the the values, we show the purpose, and they agree, and then we start getting the fund. Thank you. You're definitely being creative. And I'm going to welcome Frank. Hi, Frank. 
Hi, everybody. Hi, Wunscher. And uh, what a wonderful <laughs> group you assembled. Uh, I want just to say a few words. Um, I'm not maybe fitting into your profile. Uh, you know, you're young, you're energetic, <laughs> you're the change makers, you're the future. And uh, I think, you know, reason uh, Yonsha and I invited you is um, because you're the future, because you are, have dreams, um, you all um, run um, interesting companies you founded. And uh, we at Horas would like to support you uh, on the one hand uh, and invite you uh, to join our next meeting, hopefully in person, not uh, longer digital, but uh, we are planning the next global meeting in Portugal in early June, uh, COVID permitting, we will see, um, but also uh, to work with you and maybe to work in, in projects, in um, collaborative efforts and where we can join hands. And um, um, as I said, you know, maybe also uh, linking you up with um, the other members of the Visions community. We had uh, Richard Branson today, for example. We had CEOs of large companies. And I think they all like to meet uh, the next generation and groom them and help them. So, yeah, that's that's the idea. And I would like to thank you, Jonsha, for making this happen. Uh, we had a talk, um, maybe you remember, uh, Jonsha, this was maybe uh, around a year ago, right? Less than a year ago in, uh, in Vietnam, close to Ho Chi Minh City where we met at another uh, Horasis meeting. And then, uh, you know, with a bit of brainstorming and we got the idea of creating the next generation uh, of um, Horasis visionary leaders. And here we are. And uh, I'm very glad uh, that you made this happen. And my very personal thanks to you. And um, yeah, I'm not sure how much you already talked about the program uh, or it's already been discussed in the beginning. No, but, uh, no, I was waiting for you. I was oh, waiting okay, for you. Okay, okay. And, yeah. and, uh, and on my turn, I want to thank you, Frank, for being so open and um, for stimulating young people to join as well. Um, I saw at a conference in in, uh, in Vietnam that you had already invited quite some uh, young, inspiring leaders. Um, and I would love to um, find a way to make it easier for them to get access to these incredible people in the Horaces network. And that's why today we're officially opening the applications for the Harasses Young Visionaries Fellowship. Um, so anybody watching, um, we'll be spreading the word. Um, we have a web page on the Harasses website uh, for the Harasses Young Visionaries. People can join the community. Anybody can join the community who wants to engage with, with us uh, young leaders. And um, there, people who want to apply, who want to nominate somebody will find a place to do so. And the application will remain open for a while and uh, we will present the first fellows at the global meeting in Qashqais, hopefully uh, in June. Um, so thank you very much, Frank. <laughs> No, thank you. And um, I think I will uh, leave you um, and uh, you can actually continue. You know, it's not just the 45 minutes, but it's, um, uh, you know, to celebrate the summit. So we can go as long as you want. <laughs> but um, uh, a very personal thank you to all of you. Have a great evening. And uh, you're in very good hands with Jonsha and her vision. And uh, yeah, uh, let's be in touch very soon. Bye. Thank you very much, Frank. Yeah, great. <laughs> Cheers. Bye bye. Mabenti, you're back. <laughs> yes. Let's let's try to um, uh, have you uh, elaborate a bit on Oka's uh, situation. He's been very creative, mm -hmm. and um, this is uh, the side you are working on, actually, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, acknowledging that there's still a we're we're, we're trying to report across the continent of Africa. My background, I started at the testing network, the GEN, measurement and management training for funding. And it was a trip to training where I not only do training for funding to really assess impact, what are the, how do you do that? Um, cultural context, how do you, understand the impact of investments and services on historically communities. And it was that I had the opportunity to talk to women entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs like in, in called Ikigai, Nairobi sisters who have this dynamic. You have women entrepreneurs and 
And the common theme that I found was access to impact capital. The other common theme uh, in those conversations was how do I report on my impact in a way that's meaningful and a way that uh, improves the way I deliver my products and services. I think in the impact space, kind of engaging with investors, the common challenge I, I, I came across was how do we improve transparency and the impact that we're creating, both positive and negative? And then how do we how does that translate to um, your investees also reporting consistently on the impact that um, you're creating? And oftentimes we uh, we approach this through a top down approach where you have LPs or GPs uh, identifying metrics that may not um, be uh, pertinent to the, the investee. Uh, and you may have a list of 20 or more metrics that is overwhelming. So if you think about it through the perspective of an entrepreneur that's in the early stage that has limited staffing or capacity, one, what are the metrics that matter to me most? What information will help me make better business decisions? And then how can we become transparent in the way that we can surface what are the um, gaps, what are the opportunities, where is technical assistance needed? So for, for Live Africa, our intention is to really report and, and provide guidance not only to investors, so working with the LPs, GPs, but also the investees and entre entrepreneur support organizations like accelerators and incubators to, one, understand how can we report on impact better? Two, how can we under understand the impact on historically marginalized communities? So for us, we're looking at how can how are these investments impacting African women? as well as their communities. And then also looking at the area of ethnicity and racial equity. How can we drive both gender? And how can we look at where is the capital going? And then why is it going to a select group of people? And so how can we uh, democratize the way we uh, do impact measurement and management across the continent so that we can tell a stronger impact story? Because I believe there's so many companies that are delivering really significant impact, but they're not able to tell that in a way that is um, compelling, that also identifies both the opportunities that they're creating, but also where their challenges or opportunities to collaborate. Um, I, we look at youth. We look at um, African women. Um, the financing gap for women entrepreneurs is 42 billion, according to the African Development Bank. When we talk about unmet credit needs, it's significant in emerging economies. And so when we're looking at how do we help historically marginalized communities, it's really engaging more deeply with investors and entrepreneurs and how can we better align our efforts. And so when we think about capital, particularly for women, how can we address the, the credit gap? And then also looking at other ways of investing. Are we looking at revenue sharing? Uh, how can we leverage better philanthropic capital? I mean, now we're operating in a time of COVID and there's so many COVID relief funds, which I think is, is great. But however, how do we provide long-term capital or give investments to early stage um, businesses that have longer runway to build their companies, to make it sustainable? And then before COVID, you still had these significant gaps that are now exacerbated. So through impact measurement and management, our team is looking at how can we improve that? How can we tell this in a way that's really direct and is relevant both to the investor and the investee, as well as the, the market builders and other organizations? And the other bit for us, we're taking on the challenge of um, creating an impact fund called Kuishi Africa, uh, which is Live Africa uh, and Swahili, uh, how can we raise capital that we can then invest in early stage businesses for women uh, across health, education, the arts uh, and technology. And, and for Kuishi Africa, it's about being thoughtful about our pro approach, providing a TA facility, working with investors, identifying co-financing opportunities, and then also how can we improve access to African women? Um, before, when I was thinking about Live Africa, it was more of a clarion call so that we can drive more awareness of the dynamic businesses that are led by women. And also businesses that are considered more informal, 
like in Kenya, you have the Chamas, which is an informal group of women who pull together money that they invest in other women. You, you have it in the Caribbean called the Susus and also in, in West Africa. And sometimes we overlook these organizations because the person that we're seeking to invest in doesn't look a certain way or doesn't fit the profile of an investor. And it's really diversifying capital so that we can create this legacy where women can create businesses, support their communities, and also really acknowledging some of the challenges, especially around unpaid work. So our intention is one, to uh, bolster awareness of African women businesses and the importance of having gender balanced teams through impact measurement and management. And the second is how can we drive more capital working with impact investors, leveraging philanthropic capital and finding creative investment products that are designed to meet the needs of women where they are and also providing greater sustainability. So that's what we're passionate about. We're a, a team based in Kenya and we also work from the U.S. as well. And so my, my fellow panelists, it resonated deeply with me about we have to be innovative. We have to be thoughtful. And given the, the times that we're working in, it really lights a fire under us to be more innovative, to not use excuses to limit our innovative thinking. Um, especially given all of the investments that are now coming around sub-Saharan Africa, given the role of women, um, given the role of communities and being able to drive greater change. And so today I'm, you know, honored to be a part of this conversation so that we can identify solutions that we can begin implementing, not just in the short term, but to see that long-term impact delivered. Well, Binti, I am so happy you decided to do this. You gave me goosebumps again. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Sai, <laughs> um, do you want to share your story about how your business model is financing your business versus impact uh, investment or regular investment? Sure, sure. So, uh, so here, uh, like at Bharat Agri, we work with farmers. So these are the farmers from small, marginal, and medium size uh, in India. So I'll tell you a background of our typical user. This user earns as uh, on an average $100 per month, which is very less even to survive in India. And this is 60% population of India. So uh, if you see uh, this particular population needs to understand how to grow whatever they are growing efficiently, how to use their all resources, including land, water efficiently so that they have a sustainable uh, business out of farming something which is which they can carry out for next generation and something where they have a sustainable living right now also so uh, so i i am graduate from iit madras i did my engineering in product design and uh, i i worked uh, in one of the fmcg company in india and that's when i got exposed to uh, this farming side like uh, I, I got to know a lot about uh, farmers and I realized that this is not something which is a, uh, a sustainable thing for uh, Indian farming community, which is 60% of full India's population, which is huge. Uh, so uh, me and my co-founder, we started working on this, how we can bring our expertise. So my expertise from, uh, from product side and my co-founder, fortunately, he has expertise in biotechnology side. So uh, we work for a couple of years only to develop a solution. So because agriculture is so vast, it's a, it's a very complex science. And plus, we wanted to build a technology layer on above that. Uh, so for first two years, we were self-funded uh, because it was majorly our technology uh, initial technology developmental phase uh, after that what we did like our solution is impacting directly farmers so we approach a lot of organizations who are already working with farmers right from ngos to big companies who work with farmers to state governments telling them that this is a solution it is very effective uh, we did a lot of third party trials from national and international organizations to show the effectivity of a solution. And then we started working with the, these uh, big organizations uh, to fund our projects, to work with thousands of farmers. So that's how we started step by step. Uh, after reaching to near uh, 100K, like 100,000 farmers, uh, that was a time when we realized that 
growing organization organize by organization it's a slow process we want we can reach out to farmers directly also so we started a second revenue stream which where we opened up a solution directly to farmers also so currently we have two revenue streams where farmers pay for our solution it's a monthly subscription where we guide them through our technology month by month and the other revenue stream is where we work with different organizations so right now we work with world bank we are uh, we are world bank's technology so uh, solution provider for a uh, few of the agriculture uh, projects in india we work with few of the state governments we work with lot of ngos uh, and they provide a solution to the farmers uh in between this we also raised our uh, venture capital because the technology development was like initially with where when it was at a initial phase we did self funded but once we had to take it from few hundred to few thousand users it was not sustainable for us so that particular development aspect uh, we got it funded through a vc uh, we don't have a impact vc right now it's a it's a, a general vc but going forward uh, we would want to involve a uh, impact vc in our uh, in our company because finally it's what something which is bringing a sustainable uh, income to the farmers and any impact vc can add lot of value in this full value proposition thank you very much sai yeah, also very creative um rula Can you uh, tell us a bit about Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um I'll keep it really brief. So basically um in the early stages the way that I managed to finance kind of the product build was through grant a grant. Um and that was the early experience, very brief and early experience of what potentially VC could be like. It was a taste of VC because the grant conditions were that we had to grow grow a team and employ people. Um there was a lot of pressure to monetize quite early and show um kind of monetary kind of growth and value quite early. So what happened was just to, what we had to do was kind of dive what ended up happening was we diverted quite a lot from the mission and focused a lot on you know what who how we could monetize kind of an anti fake news product and actually there are no buyers for this except for government charities that that kind of stuff so it's not really a vc type of business so um that that was my first taste and a couple of months later i got an offer from a vc <laughs> for money because i don't know if you know yinsha but like sometimes it's really popular it's, it's sometimes you know vcs and funders run after kind of sometimes um you know machine learning or fashionable technologies um and so i i got an offer from from a vc and i had to turn it down i turned it down for several reasons the first is um i didn't feel that they were in this for the right reasons um anti fake news was kind of a cool thing bringing machine learning into that was also really cool but there's there's this kind of fomo that some vcs have the second thing is i would never take vc money and un unless i'm kind of in the position as esme said um literally about to board a rocket ship and need a need to scale so while i was kind of like scoping out the market and trying to understand you know how do we solve this problem and you know, trying to sort of prove or disprove our assumptions um it just wasn't you know it wasn't um kind of re reasonable or the right decision to make and actually funnily enough a lot of my contemporaries in this space did take vc money and it's really driven them down a path that's actually they're about to close their companies down um so yeah that's that's what i would say about that so um basically my advice in the early stages is probably to sort of just take your time and you know build an mvp make sure that there's somebody who that, that there's a clear kind of vision and pathway that you want to take and only really when people are banging down your door um to buy your product do you really need money to scale so yeah that's thank you thank you rula um we're going to i'm going to ask the same question to you uh tom um and 
our session will just continue running after these 37, 36 seconds. Huh. Um, and uh, people can stay in the session. Tom will give his answer. And I will ask everybody for like one piece of advice to close on. Tom? All right. Cool. Um, so the question was like about the funding, right? So how 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 do we do that? Um, yeah, I think our, the the way we've gone is I I'm I, I'm excited about. It. I love it um, because we've um, I mean we kind of joke within uh, the you know the investor group that it's kind of basically a bunch of uh, it's an entrepreneur club that kind of got out of hand and like now there's like you know 600 companies that they've um, really invested in. So it's really the idea really is is, is a venture publisher, um, actually. So that's what, what they call it is, is, um, I'm talking about the investors that really helped us, uh, set up the company and, and, you know, fund, uh, helped us, uh, with the initial seed money. And, um, so the difference between an, an, an incubator and, and a venture cap, uh, um, yeah, venture capital and uh, a venture publisher is that with the venture publisher, the idea is really that they invest in teams. Um, because they really believe that there's so much knowledge that's being gained while you're in, in you know, such a, an early seed stage uh, and you're trying to get a company off the ground that they uh, absolutely think it would be devastating to just see those people go. And those resources have gone to waste in a sense um, where, you know, you, when you have an incubator model, what you would do. Uh, more usually is more uh, really like, you know, give a thousand companies a bit of resources, hope that there's like five or six that emerge that maybe become unicorns and then they fund the next cycle. Like that's, that's not very efficient. It's not very, you know, it does, there, there's a lot of waste in, in entrepreneurial talent and insights in, in well, resources, quite frankly, because sometimes you don't get the unicorn that funds the next round and then it's over. And so what, um, what, what, the venture publishing model really does is that it really tries to, um, you know, I, I had a long talk with the founder about this. He said, like, we're really trying to make better entrepreneurs. That's our main goal. That's our main purpose. Um, and in that sense, they just, you know, help to kind of guide you. There's some, you know, elders within the tribe or whatever you want to call them that really are, are there like day and night with advice, uh, on, on things to do, things not to do. Uh, but in the end, it is your company and you, and you get to decide and you get to, to, to take the calls. They do take a, a stake in, in, in the company. Um, it's a majority stake, uh, most of the time. Um, but I, you know, for me at the time, Given what I wanted to do and given the, 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 the kind of almost guarantee that I was going to come out a better entrepreneur by joining that, uh, that, that part was, was completely worth it for me. So, um, I, I guess the, the funding model is really based on, on, uh, on, on preserving that human energy and those insights, uh, within that, within that organization, within that company. I don't know if I made any sense, um, uh, but, uh, I tried. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, so thank you all so much for joining this conversation. Um, I would like to do a last round and give you the chance uh, for some closing remarks. Um, Oka? Okay. Uh, I, I think, I guess my, my advice is uh, if you don't have a, a DNA, like, like chemistry, DNA uh, matchmaking, I think you shouldn't take the, the VC money. Uh, because because for, for me it's like uh, for us we are supposed to grow four hundred percent per year basic. So in, in this COVID time it it, it is it is challenging. Um, so if, if you're not ready for the VCs and if you can find other sources of funding in the early stage, uh, don't don't take the VC money. And of course if you have a really scalable tech model, then then and everybody is like buy like, like you know they are dying to buy your product, then you should take it. Um, uh, uh, also I think. Um, uh, for me, it's like I have a guilt. Like you know, I I, um, I think um, I I feel like you know I take I, I feel like I take money from other people. That means I should give it back to them uh, with the return. So so I I am constantly thinking like you know how to make more money uh, and how to survive, how to grow. That's also very stressful sometimes. So I think you have to have a balance. Like, do you really want to be stressed all the time, and, and do you really want to? Uh, have a like you know a bit more balanced chill life and and, and then like have a really good foundations and, and growth um, so uh, I, I think this really depends on what you want um, uh, 
but but there are also like other ways of financing and uh, w- without taking the VC money. So if you if you have other way of financing, if if your business model is like specific type business model, um, then uh, you don't need to take the money. Um, so that's that would be the my advice uh, to everyone. Thank you, Oka. Uh, you gave me an idea maybe for a next panel session. Maybe we'll talk about mental health of uh, entrepreneurs next time. <laughs> Rula? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So my piece of advice is to not forget uh, why you're doing what you're doing. So not don't forget the mission. Um, and to remember that it's a marathon and not a sprint. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's my piece of advice. Thank you. Sai? Uh, I will second few things uh, Rula and uh, Otto said. Uh, unless you are ready to get on a rocket ship, don't uh, think for a VC money. Till then, figure out different grants, figure out uh, different ways to make your product, uh, make a MVP. And once you are confident about that, then get to a VC fund, uh, VC funding. And I, in all, th- this is something which is applicable for all kind of companies. At the same time, if you are specially impact based company, never forget uh, what what is the actual problem which you are solving. It doesn't matter whether it's self-funded, whether it's VC-funded or impact-funded. Just uh, don't lose that uh, baseline from which you started. Thank you. Uh, Esme? Um, (coughs) I would say, um, like, fundraising is hard. It's exceptionally hard. It is one of the hardest things you'll do. And unfortunately, it comes right at the beginning of your sort of entrepreneurial journey. But I think... And what I always tell people is that just because you keep hearing no's doesn't mean that your idea isn't valid and doesn't mean that your idea could be exceptionally successful. Um, Particularly if you come from a traditionally marginalized community, your idea may not be accepted. They may not understand where you come from and they may not understand why you want to do a thing, but you there is always ways to get around it. It's more about your perseverance than anything else. Like if we look at like, Calendly is a really interesting example of somebody that could not get any funding um, and he ended up having to bootstrap and now he owns 100% of his business that's worth, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds. He could not get funding for that business and he carried on and it made him really think about every single cent of his money and probably made him a better entrepreneur because of it. Um, so I would say just, um, just don't give up. <laughs> Thank you. Tom? All right, I guess um, my advice would be more to guess, I guess, be an impact billionaire. Don't be like the old kind of billionaire. Just be, a, be an impact billionaire. What I mean with that is really, um, you know, I, I really think it's a it's about impact. Uh, I think we, you know, that we try to create a system um, that, you know, create some sort of economic productivity and all of that. Um, but we totally lost track of what the goal is. And the goal is to sustain a society in a, in a sustainable way. Um, I mean, I hope that's the goal from the get-go. I hope we didn't set out to destroy our planet because then, you know, we, we got to invent a time machine and have a talk with these people because there's something wrong. Anyway, um, so I guess be an impact billionaire in the sense of, you know, also billionaire. For me, it's, once you start thinking really big, all of a sudden there's different things that are put in motion. Like um, obviously it's not for everybody, I guess, you know, but for me, you know, when I'm thinking about Billy, I'm like, dang, that really seems impossible. And then you, you start, you start thinking a little longer and you, you find these, you know, exponential technologies and you're like, okay, well, you know, then maybe a billion isn't that, that much. And maybe I can, you know, connect to these people and wow, maybe, okay, maybe it is possible. And so just, you know, expanding what you think is possible all the time and kind of just always challenging what you what you think is the limit. Um, Because, you know, if you there's if you want to be that impact billionaire, like you need to go beyond what you what what you even can imagine at this point. And and I guess that's the that's that's my advice. Uh, I would say that just be an impact billionaire. And that's something in spirit, by the way. You don't have to actually 
impact. It would be great if you impact a billion people's lives. But yeah. Thank you. Emma Binti? I'm going to summarize this in four P's. Uh, be purpose driven, uh, be persevere, uh, be pragmatic, and this is more action oriented, partner. I think partnerships are a great way to kind of be able to collaborate, leverage resources, gain awareness. Uh, and this, and I'll add a, a fifth one, be persistent. And so I, I commend anyone who is pursuing social entrepreneurship. I remember listening to um, an impact investing conversation where the CEO said, starting a business is like 